Good afternoon. I'm Sharon McCarter, Vice President for Public Education and Outreach here at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and I'd like to welcome all of you here today. The center, as some of you may know, is the living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, and in the spirit of his life, which was dedicated to both scholarship and public policy, the center's mission is to create an ongoing dialogue between leading academics and researchers and those who are currently shaping public policy, both in the United States and around the world. Our guest speaker today is someone who embodies that dual commitment to both scholarship and public policy. In a few minutes, you'll hear more about D Dr. Deborah Willis and her program today, New Negro Women and Beyond, Posing Beauty in Afri African American Culture. Professor Willis's lecture is part of a series co-sponsored by the Wilson Center and the National Women's History Museum that aims to highlight the past, present, and future of U.S. women's history. We are extremely pleased to be partnering with the National Women's History Museum on this lecture series. Today is our fourth, le fourth lecture, and I urge you to go to our center's website or to the museum's website to see the dates, subjects, and speakers of the remaining four. At this point, I'll turn the program over to Joan Wages, who is the president and CEO of the National Women's History Museum, to give you world, words of welcome from the museum. Good afternoon, and thank you for coming. This uh, series of lectures has been just such a thrill and a delight for us at the National Women's History Museum. At the early part of last year, we, we had a group of scholars come together here at the center and start discussing the program for the National Women's History Museum. How would it be told? There's so much about women's history that it's, it's almost mind-boggling. Where do you start and what is so significant that it needs to be part of our permanent program or what should the temporary exhibits look like? So it has been eye-opening and thrilling to hear the scholars come as part of this lecture series and talk about aspects of women's history that, of course, none of us, none of us learned <laughs> when we were in school. And so we welcome you. We thank you, Dr. Willis, for agreeing to be with us today, and we hope that you will um, get the list of lectures that um, are outside on the table and join us again. Thank you. And now just a very brief introduction of our moderator for today, Dr. Yvette Richards-Jordan, who will actually, actually introduce our speaker as well and then moderate the program. Professor Jordan is an assistant professor at George Mason University, a specialist in African American history, U.S. women's history, labor studies, and pan-Africanism. She is the author of several books and articles, and among the many courses she has taught are such titles as Women and Work, Women and Global Issues, and Global Representations of Women. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yvette Richards-Jordan. Thank you very much for that introduction. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Sonia Michelle, formerly of the Woodrow Wilson Center, Dr. Sharon McCarter of the Woodrow Wilson Center, Joan Wages, CEO of National Women's History Museum, and its project coordinator, Ms. Sydney Winston, for their collective work in putting this program together and for allowing me this great honor of introducing Dr. Deborah Willis. Named among the 100 most important people in photography by the American Photography Magazine, Dr. Willis is Chair and Professor of Photography and Imaging at Tisch School of the Arts at New York University, where she also has an affiliated appointment with the College of Arts and Sciences in Africana Studies. She has been awarded um, numerous prestigious um, um, awards, including the Guggenheim Fellowship, and the Alphonse Fletcher Jr. Fellowship in 2005, the MacArthur Fellowship in 2000, 
Anonymous was a Woman Foundation Award in 1996, and just recently, in 2010, she received the Honored Educator Award from the National Conference of the Society for Pho Photographic Education. As one of the nation's leading historians of African American photography and a leading curator of African American culture, Dr. Willis is actively involved in exhibiting her photographs while also racking up an impressive record of publication. Her most recent works include Posing Beauty, African American Images from the 1890s to the Present, Michelle Obama, The First Lady in Photographs, for which she was awarded a the 2010 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work, and she is editor of Black Venus 2010. They called her her hot and tot. Dr. Willis's photog um, photographic work has been included in exhibitions in the United States, of course, Portugal, Ghana, and Canada. A little plug, I'm absolutely thrilled that this February she will give an exhibition lecture at George Mason University which will host Progeny, a collaborative photographic exhibit of work with her son, Hank Willis Thompson. I'd also like to add that we are proud that she is a Mason alum holding a PhD in cultural studies. In her scholarship, Dr. Willis has transformed the entire conversation about race and photography and evolved a methodology that combines visual and cultural studies, high style and vernacular. Her scholarship on the history of black photographers and the visual representations of African Americans has been singularly impressive in helping to build a whole new field within art history. A generation of scholars owes her a great intellectual debt. This is pretty heady stuff considering that while in high school, she was told by a counselor that she was not college material. Without further ado, as they say, I am pleased to present to you Dr. Willis, whose lecture is entitled, New Negro Woman and Beyond, Posing Beauty in African American Culture. Thank you, Yvette, and thank you. This is a, a wonderful experience for me. Um, I have um, a number of friends who have been fellows here at the center, but also I have a number of friends in the audience, and it's just an honor to see all of you and to continue to share my work and my um, just continued love for visual images. This um, talk is, it's, it's a, it's a history, rolling through a history of beauty, and, and as people will ask, well, why are you working, focusing on beauty? What's, what does it have to do with um, African American culture? And, um, and, and history, what kinds of contributions are actually thought um, that beauty has um, been denied within African American culture. And that's something that really felt was an important aspect of the research for me to consider based on the fact that there are a number of young kids today who don't believe in themselves based on looking at television, going to the movies, and not seeing anyone that they could identify with just in terms of what Toni Morrison says is beauty is something that one could just do, and that is what this project is about. And it's not necessarily identifying beauty, but it's going through this um, history. Can we dim the lights at all for the talk? So, um, so this book cover is um, the, a wonderful history for me. In the 70s, there was a... Um, you know, just in terms of style. And so I'm looking at also style and history. This is Susan Taylor, who was um, Essence magazine editor and, and, a, and a wonderful spirit in terms of writing about identity. But at the time when she made this photograph, she was in her 20s. Um, she was in Jamaica, and the Jamaican photographer photographed her. The cover um, design, I think, tells the story. It's not looking back and reflecting. So I wanted this story to have a sense of self-reflection, and that's why um, this image starts with, this, um, with her back. But also I was in Detroit, and a, a young art um, architectural historian said to me after hearing the lecture, he said, so you, you created a retroactive manifesto on beauty. <laughs> so, and I said, 
really? He says, oh, don't you understand this? This this is something, this is a manifesto that you're making. So I kind of embrace that idea. And I, I love thinking about how beauty basically destabilizes us. And it's also links to the ideas of identity and sexuality. It's also about power and desire and fear. So this project is important for me um, personally because it frames beauty as a discussion, but also in, a, in the classroom, uh, one of um, young students asked the question, is it possible um, to be a feminist and fashionable? Can a feminist wear red lipstick? And so, so, so there's a d dilemma as we go through this history. So I'm going to read some, talk about it, and then kind of teach through um, reading the image. This is a, um, so it's going to start a little earlier than the New Negro period of 1900, but I wanted to just kind of frame the history of some of these images. This is a, a, a runaway slave ad. It's uh, one of the first that I um, identify that shows, um, actually uses a photograph. It says, um, $50 reward, ran away from the yard corner of Jackson and Broad Streets, Augusta, Georgia, in the evening, on the evening of Tuesday, 7 April, 1863, a woman, Dolly, whose likeness is here seen. She is 30 years of age, light complexion, hesitates somewhat when spoken to, and is not a very healthy woman, but rather good looking, with a fine set of teeth. Never changed her owner, and had been a house servant always. It is thought that she had been enticed off by some white man, being herself a stranger to the city and belonging to a Charleston family. Um, for further particulars, apply to the city esquire and sign Louis Manicult, owner of Dolly. So when I, when I had a chance to kind of read this image and think about the history of this image, I also thought about how there's a kind of a triangular way of reading this story. Um, it's, it's, it was in the back of his um, ledger, um, found in his uh, family ledger, so it creates kind of a diary about um, desire. It also has a sense of uh, betrayal. Um, as we read, she was enticed off by some white man. Um, so there's a sense of, of entanglement there. But also the fact that he had her photographed. And he placed the photograph on this um, ledger sheet, uh, line paper, pasted, cut the photograph. It was a carte de visite, cut it in half and pasted it. The fact that it was still in his family ledger um, says a lot also because the history of that family in Manicold, if anyone from South Carolina knows that family name, that uh, four, um, there were four, quote, runaways from that uh, family. Um, they found all four. Dolly is the only, uh, quote, runaway that never was found or returned. So it's, it's a public notice that he's also showing that this is someone he desired um, as she rather, she never left his home, but she also was um, traveled with him often um, throughout her lifetime living there. So here we see Dolly, we see this story. Also it's 1863, so after emancipation. So there's still this circulation of this image and, and a story, there are uh, three, um, scholars have written about her, um, a wonderful uh, research projects that are developed. But also as I began to think about images and looking at this history, looking at the Civil War and images of the Civil War and, and thinking about how do we visualize emancipation and considering that story, women wrote letters to, black women wrote letters to Abraham Lincoln asking, um, really concerned about the idea that their husbands were not paid for um, their service. And so the concern was that, um, so the letters, there's a wonderful book by Pamela Newkirk, and it's called um, Letters from Black America. Also, she has one on love letters. Well, here we begin to see why um, this young soldier who was from Cecil County, County Maryland, um, who is posed with his uniform, um, with his two children and his wife, wife stylishly dressed. He's in his uniform. And so there's a sense of hope as we begin to read this image of desire for equal equality. And so here, um, this, is, uh, this image was found in, in a belongings of, of a family in, in Maryland. 
But again, as we look at this image and see the importance of family, women actually writing and telling their story and concern for their, their husband's um, care and the fact that they were not um, paid as soldiers. Now, this image just is um, one that just um, is really shocking. Um, it's a photograph by a black photographer, James Presley Ball. This was made um, during the 1860s, um, during this period. Here we see in Cincinnati, this is a um, sergeant from Wisconsin um, and a postmaster from Wisconsin, and we see a young black woman seated in the chair. Don't know the history of this image, but we can imagine um, the notion of violence as, as created through the gesture of the guns drawn she is seated, her face is still, and her, her eyes are extremely quiet in terms of that, the, the expression on her face. But also that James Presley Ball, a black photographer who was an abolitionist, who was concerned about the plight of blacks, um, posed and, and photographed this subject is something I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, exploring in, in another project. But I also found it important to look for women in images, look for stories that related. Here is um, Frederick Douglass um, at a conference, um, a Fugitive Slave Convention in 1850 in Madison County in upstate New York. <clears throat> so here um, we see a woman in the back, and she's wearing plaid. Um, they're women, black women, with, they're white and black women, but we also women with their hats and stylish and dress. I'm fascinated because I want to really get a history of who's making these clothing, who's going through this sense of reframing um, these images because the images that we know from the past are the dress of black women not considered in this, in this fashionable way. Also considering images of um, including images of Harriet Tubman, as well as Sojourner Truth. And stories that tell the story of women who were really active during um, the emancipation and also concerned about education for children. And this is Charlotte Fortin uh, Grimke, who was the first black teacher in South Carolina Sea Islands, and she also wrote a diary. But here we see the photographer posed her with a book and also looking um, away from the camera and just concerned about look and desire in, in that sense. So framing this, these questions, you know, I struggle with how to think about images and, and researching these images. Also that J.P. Ball, um, at the time, um, Montana um, photographer, he moved from Cincinnati to Wisconsin, later to Minneapolis, then uh, Montana. So we can imagine this 1890s period that um, Helena, Montana was an, an important city for, for blacks during that time because it was the gold rush. And this is um, within a 20 year period after emancipation where blacks began to imagine their lives changing. We see also cross-cultural experiences with this young woman who is framed with a, um, a scroll that often indicated education, a, a graduation portrait, but she's also wearing a dress that's stylized, that has an Asian um, style and feel. So there were a number of Chinese Americans living in this area of um, Montana during that time. Also, uh, one of the images that I, I just find um, fascinating, this is Aunt Memory Adams um, from Tallahassee. She attended the 18... 93 World's Fair in Chicago and decided that she would pose and sell her photograph. So here again we see that um, Sojourner Truth was one woman who sold her photograph as she says that she sold her photograph um, selling the substance, um, selling the shadow to sustain the substance. But here we begin to see other women, which was new information for me, where women were actually selling their photographs that were not stereographed or not caricatures, but women who actually showed the sense of work. Here she has, she's carrying a pail, she's carrying her handbag and, and an umbrella, a broom. So we see this a sense of occupation portrait 
And so we see and read this as a way of a woman who is, and her name is Aunt Memory. And so we begin to real, realize this in a different way. So women, this is in um, Missouri. So um, posing with hats and then going through the experience of emancipation and, and, and celebration. So here, this is in Lincolnville, Florida in the 1920s. And, and so I'm just kind of going back and forth with this experience of, of travel, but also that the communities who decided that they would celebrate their freedom and, and emancipation and have pageants and, and celebrations through music and also you know, kind of as creating cars with skirts and, and, and fabric and, and trying to create this, as, as we say today, what is it, Mark, when they make cars fancy? Pimp the car or something like that. <laughs> you know, pimp my ride. So, so that's not new. So we can see that people are, like, creating pageantry in, in different ways. So... So Emancipation Day here, this is 1905 in Richmond, Virginia. We can see a celebration. We see crowds. We see, you know, families dressed, holding hands. And, and this is a, an exciting time for people. But we can also see, and as I always look for the woman in the crowd, what she's wearing, you know, what the, the experience of sense of, of pride, the fact that Men are dressed as dandies and, and, and women are, you know, fashionably dressed, their hairstyles, and that they're leading marches and, and considering these, these moments. And, and then another experience is um, looking at the photographs of women who advertise. And this is a photograph of Madam C.J. Walker and Sarah Breedlove Walker, Pennsylvania Negro Business Directory, 1906. And I'm just going to read a description in the directory, and this is a, a critique of, of her look. In her full-length directory photograph, Madam Walker struck a more refined pose than she had in her 1906 Denver newspaper ad. Reflecting her increased income and newly acquired status, she wore a dress with a delicate ivory lace bodice, a thick fabric belt cinched her waist, accentuating her full-figured but well-portioned body with her hands clasped behind her back. The only sign of her former life as a farm worker and washerwoman was her stumpy shape of her forearms. Now, this is how um, someone is reading her body and imagining her body through the aspect of labor. But he says, but of course it was her hair that she wished to emphasize. Madam Walker had pinned her hair now, healthy tresses into a well-coiffed crown. And so it's stylized gracefully and swooshed. And, but the fact that at this time in 1906 that they're reading her body and as if she is um, part of this history that, <clears throat> that imagines a, a woman in a different light. Again, um, as I begin to think about women and looking at the images of women and work, women in terms of their occupational portraits, this is a woman by the name of Molly who worked for um, a family. She was a maid for Mary Chestnut. She was Mary Chestnut's maid. And they became business partners in a dairy farm after um, the Civil War. And she also published her diary in 1905. Then um, as I traveled throughout, I noticed uh, in the West, um, this is a photograph by Edward Curtis. Uh, uh, it's entitled Desert Queen. And i thinking of the idea of Edward Curtis, who only photographed Native Americans. But the fact that um, when looking at a black woman, there's also not just a queen, but had to identify her as a desert queen to signify um, the notion that she was othered and, and, and African. And, and she was living in Seattle and working and as a student. W.B. Du Bois in 1900 created an exhibition called The, the Georgia Negro. And so this is W.B. Du Bois in Paris, stylized. He went to the most famous photographer, Nadar Studios, in Paris and stood and just imagined his body within this whole sense of 1900, this whole sense of the modern man. He created images that um, changed the notion of how blacks were viewed within this experience of the public arena 
of, of images in World's Fairs. Most of the images of blacks in World's Fair were considered, um, they were seen as othered, um, they were seen as anthropological studies, they were seen as sci scientific bodies. But here, Du Bois decided to hire photographer Thomas Askew to photograph, and he included 360 photographs of men, women, and children, and, and homes. But he wanted to show um, the diversity of the communities, um, the changes that were going on, because this is what was normally seen in world fairs, um, where women, black women, were objectified and seen as um, humorous, but also see their bodies of, as labor. So this is a roundabout. This is a merry-go-round. This is seen as fun. Um, Someone would find pleasure in riding the, black, the backs of black women. Um, also to see the exposed breasts. Um, so the body as a black woman is always seen as, as labored. Um, she's holding a white baby, she's her breast exposed, families are riding in the back. Um, so we've seen this image. So Du Bois is countering this image by creating an exhibition where um, we see women as uh, club women, women um, in middle class status, that, that their clothes were signifiers of, of how they um, imagined themselves and believed in their, in their flight and their future. Um, and images such as this um, of a dress, the bustle. It has a history related to the image of the woman who was known as Sarah Bartman, but also known as the Hot and Top Venus. And these are drawings from 1810 and creating these um, experiences of black women that were public, that circulated, that also experienced other, um, black women as othered and, and non-desired. Um, but then we begin to see the bustle and how that kind of counters that argument by creating this desired buttocks, desired sensual experience in fashion. But then images circulated like this. This is um, a restaurant, Mammy Restaurant, photographed by Edward Weston in 1941. And so here, these are the images that are um, blacks are countering. Um, we see also the the tray is placed. This is in um, in Arizona, and then that's 1941, and this is today, in Natchez, Mississippi. Um, same same type of, of look of the woman with the um, going through her skirt um, is very sexualized in the way that um, the restaurant is, is viewed and it was just on um, television just recently um, just this whole experience so we begin to see how these public monuments of, of black women are used um, and and exploited but also um, balancing out this experience of, of style and concern for me was to also to look at finding images. This is a slave reunion from 1916, Washington, D.C. Um, um, this is um, Lewis Martin. He's age 100 on the left. Mary Elizabeth Banks, 104. Amy Ware, 103. And Reverend Simon Drew, born free. Cosmopolitan Baptist Church here in DC, 921 North, in 921 in Street Northwest. So here we begin to see this kind of dialogue that we rarely hear about experiences that there were there's there were reunions, there were connections that were created um, within these families. This is a convention also in um, 1916, probably the same convention of former slaves. Images that I also found in the West um, of women, and I just wanted to just kind of just look at style and dress, the gloves, the hats, the experience um, for women just posing um, within um, with different hairstyles. Earrings were important, but also to think about the image of the Fist Jubilee singers, the women in, in the images, how um, they were students and they were hired off to raise money for the university. Um, they, m many of them, they um, didn't graduate the first group, um, but five years they were, and the school was in, in dire financial straits, so they traveled all over Europe and also to Africa. 
And so, but this, the group left in, in October 6, 1871 on Jubilee Day, basically to celebrate the university, but also to travel around to raise money um, for the university. And they, they sang at the White House, they sang in Boston, but also in South Africa. So again, as we think, as I wanted to explore the ideas of how people are celebrating um, Jubilee in terms of celebrations of Emancipation Day, images of, of young women riding their horse with the American flag, to women going to, um, this is <clears throat> another festival, this is in Hannibal, Missouri, um, just attending a festival, and 1904, at the World's Fair in St. Louis. And again, this is Francis Benjamin Johnson, and as I talk about these images, I just want you just to experience the beauty, the grace, the whole experience of the women posing, the, the style of dress. And these are, you know, an experience that we rarely see circulated. This also, in terms of how do we frame these stories through types of images that circulate it, this is a, these are, cigarette cards that were placed in, in tobacco and cigarette packages, national types of beauty, a series of 36 actual photographs. It says Argentine, is, is this pleasing portrait, in this pleasing portrait of a beautiful subject has revealed a, beautif a beauty associated with the capital of this South American Republic. They also had Egypt. Um, so this typifies um, Egyptian beauty, dainty, graceful, dark hair, um, features brown eyes and olive complexion. My um, a student, a freshman, I had a, I taught a class um, called Beauty Matters, and a freshman um, was in uh, at a swap meet in New Mexico, and he said, "Wow, you know, I found these photographs, and there were no black women in these photographs." And you know, Professor Willis, I, I re I'm concerned about this. Uh, what do you think? You know, so so he sent he bought a pack for me, and it was really exciting for to see you know a freshman who's really excited about the, my research and then sharing it. So I decided to kind of look through this aspect of how women are objectified. You know that. They are placed in cigarette holders and, and, and ads and tobacco so that men could actually experience looking at beautiful women from around the world as they're smoking. And, and they're looking at this experience of actual photographs. And so then I had to get all involved in this trying to find, well, where are the black women? Where we have to tell them, I got to objectify these women. So it became humorous for me to try to, to figure this thing out. So I found this image of, um, of Josephine Baker. And so she's the only one, but it says this is one of a series of 50 real photographs. So the language really becomes important, these actual and these real photographs. So as men smoke, they look at women and they experience these, um, these sense of desire through these, um, these images. This is a photograph of, of Anna Mae Wong, who was one of the most important um, Chinese actresses in, in the 20s and, and models during this period. So, and then also looking at images who, of women who basically wanted to empower themselves to leave home, to leave the sense of domestic work and create, let me go back to, let's see, how do you go back? Let's see. So anyway, I'll go, let me go back, oh, I'll talk about this one. Let me see how this thing works. Preview, previous, okay, okay. And then, let me see, <laughs> sorry. I'm such a Mac person, so sorry. <laughs> um, so thinking about how women made decisions to become singers and dancers, leaving their desired um, locations and, and deciding to perform. And so these are photographs of um, one of my favorites of, of a woman who's looking in the mirror, reflecting her beauty with a powder brush as she brushes her um, a powder on her back. But her hairstyle is important because this is the year that King Tut's tomb was open. And so the style of her hair is called the Tut Cut. And so we began to see how this sense of globalism early on, where women are traveling and, see, and experiencing style, and then this image, where in, during the period of the 1880s and 90s, the mail-order brides were um, 
were desired by miners who were moving west. And so women traveled to studios to pose and have their photographs made and sent to the some of the young men who were looking for women who were educated, so women who posed in this kind of desired look. There was also the Blackbirds of London who traveled in, in the 20s. And so we began to see this range of experience of body types uh, of women, but also the experience of, of women who had ideas about themselves outside of domestic work. Um, this is a beauty contest in Pacific Beach, California. This is a, it says, uh, women's beauty will win prizes. So here, the four women on the front, they won the prize. And Pacific Beach is outside of San Diego. The important aspect of this is to look at community and community pride. Um, 1924 boardwalk, um, the structure was built by the community, this panoramic photograph, this large crowd supporting the idea of discussing um, talent and beauty. But after this photograph was taken, the, the um, clubhouse was burned down by the racists in the community. So we begin to see where it stopped because they, they were threatened by the fact that this is a celebrated community that the large crowd attended, and the purpose was to celebrate and to educate and critique this and critiquing this image. Also, um, P.H. Polk, um, a photographer in Tuskegee, also photographed the former um, enslaved women and men in that community. And so he found ways to celebrate them by having them posed, you know, with you know, cigarettes or with uh, pipes, but also the way that they dressed. He says that this is a, a apron that she wraps around her head and to create a hat and create style. This is um, club women. I, I think this is a really special moment as we begin to see how women, they're, they're posing. Um, not sure the history of this image, but here are seven women, seven women in Missouri um, possibly, you know, a club, but the way that they're holding hands and telling a story about their relationship as, as, as they combine um, stories about the future. And women photographers, it was really important for me to identify and find, and this is one by Florence Dean Collins, and again, this whole notion of the tut cut, 1920s, Florence Dean lived in New, in, in, um, New Orleans in the Treme um, section. She had her photographic studio in her living room. And within that experience, because she was light-skinned, she, um, she performed as a photographer's assistant, and he thought that she was white. So she learned a lot because he left her in the studio, and she was able to um, learn the business aspect, but also the artistic. So here she's posed her friend, who was a maid, and as we begin to think about women who work as maids and not identifying with her body and occupation, she has her, her watch, her, her nice little heels, and she's posed in this desired um, look. So here, James Latimer Allen photographed Madonna and Child, and we begin here now in the 20s, where we begin to see a range of images that were used um, to empower um, these communities. Um, the focus was on self-representation through religion, um, through pageantry, um, through Mardi Gras. This is in Mardi Gras Queen in, in the 20s in Oakland, California. But then um, also in the 20s, the women who, who were concerned with um, Messenger magazine, concerned with the images of black women and, and the stories that were ex that they were experiencing, that they decided that they would um, week by week um, take a city and photograph and visit and and highlight the women in the cities. This is the Messenger. Um, this is exalting Negro womanhood. This is in Washington D.C. And we see on the upper right is Nanny Helen Barrows. We see a range of women and the styles and, and the poses they photographed in Richmond and, and different cities. And we begin to see, they said that we're, we're going to go, 
We are going to take them by states, displaying two or three pages of these women artistically arranged in each month. So this is a concern where they were looking for different ways to talk about how do we change and reflect um, women. Um, also, 1935, um, the cover magazine, uh, a cover girl that here we see Hattie McDaniels um, on the cover of Silhouette Pictorial. And I love the aspect of how um, black magazines name themselves, you know, from ebony. It's always about color, you know, like ebony, sepia, silhouette. You know, so we began to see how actively that they're identifying aspects of color. Here she is. She won the um, Hattie McDaniel's Mammy role in Gone with the Wind, but she's in her white fur coat. She has her white baby grand in the back, and so she <laughs> notices um, the difference. Also, in terms of how ads are using Africa as a reference, the Nile Queen um, to celebrate Africa, but also the legacy of beauty in, in this history. And, and then images such as this, what I found of Zora Neale Hurston, and Zora Neale Hurston says um, she, in 1938, she wrote to Carl Van Vechten, who made the photograph, and here I see she's looking sensual and shy and confident, and in 1934, a letter to Van Vechten, she wrote, Carl, darling, send the pictures here. I'm so excited about them. I can hardly wait. Frankly, I feel flattered that you wanted to photograph me. I am conscious of the honor you do me. After reviewing the photograph, she says, dear Carl, the pictures are swell. I love myself when I'm laughing and then again when I'm looking mean and impressive. You know. So here we begin to see how women are identifying with ways of how do you tell these different stories. Women who are Easter Sunday with their families um, walking in the streets in Harlem. You know, young family, young couple to um, Cartier Bresson's photograph of the brown skin models. Um, this is, uh, Cartier Bresson is known as the photographer who created the term the decisive moment and how you make a photograph at, at, a, at a decisive moment. Here, the axis of this image, he's looking at a man looking at a woman who is also is just as beautiful. So this, this exchange is there between the photographer, the subject, the pedestrian in the back, and then the subject of the um, the photograph. I just happened to be in London one year and I met uh, one of the brown skin models and she said, oh, you know, I was, I was Easter Sunday, I was walking down the street. We, we were preparing for a parade and we heard this famous European photographer was there and, and we were ready and running to take these, get our photograph made. And, and then the youngest model who was not n normally there walked past and he photographed her. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so it was just a funny story to hear um, because I've loved this photograph for years, but to hear the history that they just, you know, made sure that they were there. And so this photograph is, is part of that, that history of decisive moment. Hairstyles also important. This is Charles Teeny Harris. This is the hairstyle called the double V. Um, double V during the 1940s, during the uh, World War II, that was victory at home and victory um, abroad. That women hairdressers created dresses and styles and skirts. They also wore pins on their lapels. Men who did not um, um, fight um, across and in, in, in Europe, but the hairstyles. It was a reminder within the communities that we needed victory at home and abroad. Uh, Tini also made photographs of, of um, there's a major exhibition now in Pittsburgh at the Carnegie Museum, but he also um, photographed famous people who visited um, that um, city. But here we see Lena Horne at the mirror. But the, the way that he's photographed her, he's over the shoulder, he's actually understanding and reflecting. He loved Lena Horne as, as a subject. He's a, a number of photographs of her. But here... We see her. She was also a cover girl. She was also a pinup for, for black soldiers in, in World War II. But the fact that he has um, her Western Union, where someone is sending her a message of, of well wishes and good luck, that she has it pinned in this kind of this um, sparsely um, decorated um, backstage room. But the, her face cream and, and the way that Teeny is able to frame this photograph is just, just a wonderful moment to, to reflect on how icons are alone in, in the morning and at night, 
but also that they are reminded by this notion of the Western Union placed there to know that someone is caring and thinking about them, that, and also that, that Teeny was able to photograph that and, and create that moment. Also, um, I was in New Orleans and, and, and researching this project and, and ran across this image, Dixie Bells. So this is a photograph by Theodore Winans um, here in central Louisiana, 1938. Two young sisters um, waiting for a ride, possibly Sunday afternoon, but the style of their dress, their um, their jewelry, um, their hats, um, the hoop earrings. So all of this is still a part of this this notion of. But then the experience of women, young girls, white man photographing them. You know, they're looking directly at and in, into his camera lens but also that he also identified that these young women were um, beautiful to, to photograph. Um, this is a Teeny Harris photograph of a woman with her car. Um, mainly we see in family albums men in their cars. So it's just wonderful to see this um, photograph of, of, and her name is Mary Louise um, Harris. And also um, photograph of, I, Eudora, of Eudora Proctor. This is in Oakland, California. And here we begin to see how, um, you know, unidentified photographers, but she's in the photography studio. She's looking for a way to show um, the possibilities of her future. So we begin to think about how to read the possibilities for some of these people who are going to the, food, to the photographic studios as they found ways to create um, innovative poses and um, desired looks. Teeny Harris again. Um, this is the Crawford Avenue Grill, and we see a young woman as she stops um, to pose for Teeny. And it's, it's known that Teeny Harris is, um, he was also known as the Teeny the Little Lover. And so as I think about his history, and I think about that she stopped to work stop her work based for a moment to pose for Teeny. But the fact that the pencil shavings are also still a part of this working occupational portrait, that she's, you know, here the pencil shavings are there, a man has his hat flipped over the side, but then the, the Crawford Avenue Grill is a mixed in terms of places, what happens in this place that they have um, a bar on one side and then a woman in her evening gown walking through and a man in a cap and gown, a, a cap um, seated um, on the bar stool. And then um, aspects, as, as I mentioned earlier, aspects of how beauty was central within our, within our communities, that publications and, and church clubs decided this is in, um, in the collection at the Smithsonian, which is really excited about that, that this is there and part of Henry Clay Anderson's collection. And here we see body and image as a story to create this, the cultural life of communities, that businesses and, and churches created these pageants to raise money, but also photographers created um, one of the best contests that I've loved is the Miss Fine Brown Frame, <laughs> you know? that um, just knowing these California photographers created, and this is in Jet Magazine, and we see the sense of pride. Um, this is in St. Louis Beauty uh, Contest. Um, so here she is, um, Yvonne is a student at Washington University Secretarial School, but just the fact that she's Miss Fine Brown Frame. And here is Miss Fine Brown Frame again. You know, she's 16 years old, she's in, uh, Mich in, in Michigan, um, she's a ballet and modern dance student, and she won a prize of $10 and a pearl bracelet. So here we begin to see how um, communities decided to kind of uplift and, and through this experience of creating different stories and imagining ways to create um, stories. And as, as I said, I love um, listening and meeting some of the older people as they share the stories. <coughs> Also, um, this photograph here of Rosa Parks, um, again, um, jewelry, the central way of presentation, her pearls, her black gloves, and looking um, with the button. One of the things that I, you know, in terms of reading 
the whole history that she didn't speak, but she was prepared. You know, she was prepared to tell her story and as she posed um, for Bob Edelman, the photographer. And, and an, another way of looking at naming, self-naming, this is a photograph of Eve Arnold, who died just last week at the age of 99. Her, this is a model by the name of Fabulous. You know, her name, her uh, given name is Charlotte Stribling, and she waits at the backstage as, as she begins to model the clothes at the Abyssinian Baptist Church in the 1950s. So here we begin to see a woman, a young woman who decided to change her name. She's known as Fabulous, and she sees that. And, you know, her blonde hair, she seizes the moment as this photographer um, photographs. Um, Eve Arnold photographs also the debutante, the, the correct way of the curtsy, um, the importance of, of that moment. But she also photographed this, um, this moment during the civil rights movement in Virginia and there where blacks and whites are introduced in the school and, they're, and she's in the bathroom and she's looking at this moment as these two young girls prepare to meet. And they meet in the bathroom with lipstick. And Eve Arnold is is just um, just an amazing photographer to actually capture this range of of, of looks and experience of the, of the black and white community. Photograph of Danielle Luna by Richard Avedon. She was the first internationally known um, African American model. And here she's posed with a hat. This was never published in um, in the magazine. But she's known, um, she was the first black woman on Harper's Bazaar magazine and also others um, in Europe when she left Detroit. But we can see that he liked that image because there's a grease mark on, this, on the corner. This is one that he had planned to use in, at some point. Um, and then, of course, um, moments as we go into the 60s, as I think about this beyond period, the image of Angela Davis, who posed by um, for Philip Halsman, that he decided that he wanted to photograph her because he was fascinated with her story, with her leather, with her beret and her leather jacket, and you know the gun and the whole experience. And so she said when she visited the studio, he says, "Well, where's your leather jacket and where's your beret?" And so she said, <laughs> "She said, no, this is how I want to pose." You know, not in in the imagination of 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 his history of 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 her, but here is this wonderful moment where she begins to take her image and controls it. And and then uh, Miss Black America, nineteen sixty eight. We see the range of images here of styles. We see hair. Um, we see African inspired fabric. Um, we see this range of this moment of 1968 where women and, and, and young women and music, we see this moment, who is going to meet Miss Black America, the first Miss Black America contest. Fashion shows were popular um, for the 50s and 60s, 70s with, um, you know, the hot pants and, you know, where art imitates life, Anthony Barboza's photograph. We, you know, we think about movies in, in this moment. And also church. You know, um, the experience of, of um, Georgia, and this is in Savannah, where we see the experience of uh, mothers and, and women in church. We see also artists who are exploring um, moments of how do we think about America? You have to be white to be beautiful, to be Miss America. We see this image in terms of Carla Williams and thinking about Venus as we look at the history of women. Um, we see women's bodies change. Also with Micheline Thomas, um, Sister, Sister, Lady Blue, um, from her Odalis series. She grew up in Camden, New Jersey. Her mother had a lot of friends, and they were always beautiful, as she says as a young kid, that they had big afros, they had high heel boots, and they were just striking. And then she creates her studio in the manner of the house with the paneled in the backdrop, and her mother inspired her with all of the African fabric from that period. So all of her work, and you, if you have a chance to see her work at 30 American Show, you'll see some of um, the way she works with painting. And then Renee Cox, it's called Baby Back, 
And she's basically flipping the script with the moment of, of how most odalis and, and desired women are seen looking at the camera. She's turning her back to the camera. She's t- taking control, as she says, by using red high heel shoes and the bullwhip. So who's in control as she <laughs> creates her, her series with this? Sheila Pre Bright. Um, it's called Plastic Bodies, and she's also exploring ideas about how distorted young girls are feeling today as we think about the Barbie image, um, from creating you know, eyes that, that are too large or too made up, but also creating a Barbie that had hoop earrings. Um, so that was something that, that she was exploring and looking at Barbie as a desire, but also a, a frightening um, experience. So she uses the real face of someone, the imagined face of, of a Barbie, and she merges the two. Um, Jeannie Matusame Ash is also looking at the aging body and, and asking questions about desire through the aging body. Lorna Simpson, um, who is a New York photographer, found on eBay Uh, photographs of of a young woman who posed for a photographer, unidentified photographer, unidentified black woman. So Lorna decided that she wanted to buy a couple of the images, and then she bought some, and then the person who sold her the photograph said that we have, I have 100 images plus. So he decided, so she decided to buy them. So she decided to create the poses, and Lorna's in the center, um, you can see the different poses, uh, but Lorna's act, the actual Lorna images, and just and Lorna said it was really uncomfortable, you know, that just the way that she posed for these images. But this is a woman who was in California, so when I think about Miss Fine Brown Frame, and I think about women who moved to California to model, to act, to have that experience, was this a possibility that this young woman desired to be a model, desired to be an actress, and created her own portfolio? So Lorna is, is, is working through um, these poses and creating um, some of the structures and, and just imagining women who are looking into the camera and, and creating a different kind of public space and a, a different kind of fascination as people consume these images. She also bought a number of images um, from the photo booth and just created images of women and, and created this public experience of women in the photo booth. What, why women posed, um, she was curious about, but what did they pose with? What happened to the photographs? What did they use um, in the image? And a number of women photographers are experienced in asking questions, like Carrie Mae Weems. She says, I looked and looked to see what so terrified you. So she's thinking about how black women have frightened this whole public this public image, and, and you see the beauty. She created a dress um, from the 19th century and created this story. She also, and then just a few more images left, but she has this series, it's, it's entitled Not Manet's Type, that she says, um, I knew um, not from memory but from hope that there were other models by which to live because um, but it could have been worse. Imagine my fate be if de Cooney had gotten a hold of me. It was clear I was not Manet's type. Picasso, who had a way with women, only used me, and Duchamp never even considered me. So using this posing, she creates this with her in her own um, living room and, and bedroom. And standing on shaky ground, I posed myself for critical study, but was no longer certain of the questions to ask. And so thinking about that history, just transformed her her moments to Augie Ogburn's photograph here of little Kim and the notion of her as seen as Queen Bee to Ife's photograph of looking at the images of women um, in 2006 of Pam Greer um, and how women in the movies had to have a gun, be sexy, and have an afro hair and hoop earrings again. You know, this hoop earring story is, is, is something that, to explore. To the whole aspect of, of dance hall and, and the experience of dance hall, <coughs> and this is Petruska Bazin's photograph, Corset. 
that women are always on display and un under surveillance, that a, a, cam a guy with a camcorder is following this young woman at a club, and we see how women are objectified in different ways. And so Tuca photographs the camcorder just to show how women are seen, that women who want to dress and, and fashionably, but also um, not necessarily go home with the man that they meet at the club. Um, one of my favorites, Pickin, <laughs> this is Lauren Kelly. She's looking at um, the history of, of a time period of the 70s when the Afro pick and the power of, of black hairstyles. And so she created this, this crown. And uh, this caused a, a number of problems about two years ago in Publishers Weekly when um, it was on the cover of Publishers Weekly, both black and white women wrote to the editor. And because he thought he was being, you know, kind of witty, and he says, pick, you know, picks, um, Afro picks for Black History Month. And so he was, he pointed out all of the, the new books for, for that dealt with African American culture. Well, he was attacked. He says, oh, that was a woman, she's ashamed of her body, she's ashamed of her hair. Look how her head is posed, she's looking down. They could not see that this is a crown of fists, it's a crown of strength. Um, so we had to write a letter to the editor. Hopefully he still has his job, but we had to support him through a curator, the artist, and myself, writing to how to, how to read this image in a positive way, that the letters were written or about shame, um, and it was a really difficult time. Um, also, Linda Murray is a bodybuilder. This is Annie Leibovitz's photograph. And we begin to see range of experiences of women, the strength um, to Timothy Greenfield Sanders' photograph of Serena Williams, which uh, was on um, display at the Portrait Gallery. And then also Annie Leibovitz's image of this wonderful lady, Michelle Obama. Um, I'm going to show two more images and then um, open up for questions. This is my photograph. I'm photographing, it's called Mother Wit. I'm thinking about um, how do we pass on stories and, and share information. So I invited uh, 250 friends to send me notices or words that they live by based on their mothers or grandmothers. So this says, um, so some, you know, unidentified, but I just find it really amazing. Better to marry no man than the wrong man. <laughs> Um, a man told me that his mother said, you can't carve rotten wood. Uh, still water runs deep. Um, <laughs> um, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And my favorite is it's good to have a candy man. <laughs> <laughs> to catch a lover, take, tape his picture behind the mirror. Um, I feel like I'm trudging molasses uphill. Um, one man sent me this, if you lie down, his mother said, if you lie down with dogs, you're bound to get fleas. So, um, if, and this is one that my grandmother said to me, if it don't start right, it won't end right. <laughs> so one point, so I decided to put the words on the belly as kind of a, a folk tale of, of, of experience. But then this last image is, is just new for me. And I'm experiencing it, and, and I'm, I'm kind of loving it based on Deanna Lawson's new work. And she is a photographer who's a young photographer who had a show at the Met. And so I'm, I'm kind of slowly going into this one because this is Diva at 73. And um, so this is a new image. I haven't spent a lot of time with it, but I'm going to write about this image. And, and it's just a fascinating way of how... Deanna, Deanna Lewis Lawson, I'm sorry, Deanna Lawson is looking at this history of images of desire and beauty and sexuality. And sh as she photographs this woman at 73, she titles it Diva at 73, but she also has this sense of how the woman lived in her Harlem apartment. She lives around art, um, self portraits, um, style, shoes, dress. And so that's the kind of range of experiences that um, I um, wanted to explore. So thank you so much.
Dr. Willis, for that wonderful um, presentation and the beautiful visual presentation along with your talk. And so now I'll open, if we want to bring up the lights, I don't know, um, I'll open up the floor to questions. Okay. Ooh, there we go. Okay. All right. Susie? Mm -hmm. um, okay. I wanted to ask you about the ant memory picture, and I was just curious if you could say a little bit more about how I, these photos were sold. You said they were. Yeah, um, it's in Tallahassee um, Historical Florida Memory Collection, but she um, attended the 1893 World's Fair. She was proud that she had a chance to go, and I think she attended with her employer um, that she understood that photographs were, um, she made a living by selling her own photographs. So that's part of that history of exchanging. And I'm, I'm really, I'm researching this story more um, to learn more about her. Do you know where she was selling them? Who she in Tallahassee, Florida. Just selling them in the community. Right, and, yeah. and, and talking about her experience attending um, the World's Fair. But at I, I assume and, and I just imagine that she probably had a chance to see other cell photographs yeah. and the photographs of the stereotypes and the caricatures were sold popularly and widely. But here is a woman who could sell a photograph um, and actually experience it in a different way. Yeah. You know, where she's a, showing her occupation. She has a broom, she has a mop. Um, she has a pail, she has a handbag, so she's making money. Yeah. So she's yeah. holding that. So she's telling a different story through the, how the photographs are, are, are used. Yeah. Yes. Oh, there's someone in the back. Okay. Thank you mm -hmm. so, so much. Um, I got lots of notes. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess my, my question for you is, how much do you think um, – or how valuable are black pageants in sort of um, rehabilitating some of the negative images that we've seen in the past concerning black women? How important are black pageants to the rehabilitation of black women's image in America, particularly I, I, pageants I run by black people? I think they're important today because um, there, there needs to be a dialogue today about, about the history. And so the pageants are creating a center for people to have an open discussion. Um, and I think to have the pageants, I mean, I, when I was, you know, I know like Kinshasa's here and I know we've gone through similar lifestyles, but you go through this at, you know, 15, 16, you're like, you know, I don't, I'm not interested in that kind of experience. But then at the same time, that was a community um, that to made sure that you had an education, that you continued because they were outside people who were telling you you couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. So that's the experience why I think the pageants are um, kind of a, a center for people to ground themselves in, in a way. And, and some people um, misuse it um, based on this recent piece that was in the paper about Beyonce and this new image where her skin is lightened mm -hmm. and she's um, in this really sexy pose. You know, but we see Diva at 73, she's still, you know, <laughs> looking for that experience. But um, so we just have to balance. I think that's the hard part for, for we there's so many extremes in our community and we just need to find a way to balance. Yes. There was someone all the way in the back, yeah. Everyone else really needs the microphone. Would you mind if I went without it? <laughs> um, welcome back to the neighborhood, Doc. Thank you. Um, to put your question back to you, how do we pass on stories and share information? There are a couple of pieces that I found especially rich in the portfolio. One was Atlantic City for women. The other is uh, Russell Lee's street photographer, a street photograph, New York City. Mm -hmm. um, my mother has a gang of photos like those, you know, passed down from her mother and her grandmother. What are your thoughts, your personal thoughts on those kinds of photos as sort of symbolic and, and emblematic? Well, you know, I grew up going to Atlantic City from Philadelphia my entire life. So I remember seeing, in terms of girlhood, you know, you know women just going, walking through on the boardwalk, 
to celebrate, having a great time um, celebrating, but also Easter Sunday, that photograph of uh, Russell Lee's photograph, and those street portraits are, um, he actually is a white photographer photographing a black photographer, photographing a young black boy with his new suit. And I think that there, there are stories that, that create a sense of pride. You, you, you see the photograph. And those of you who um, have a chance to dash over to the National Portrait Gallery bookstore at 6 o'clock, books will be on sale there today. Um, so hopefully you'll have a chance to um, pick up the book and see that page specifically. I found that photograph and had never, and I studied photography for 30 years, had never um, experienced most of these photographs in my history books. And so as a cre uh, creating a different narrative, um, I really think that it's important for historians and people who are teaching photography that Russell Lee photographed not only whites um, and some of the Japanese experience, but he also photographed these range of, of moments. And I think that that's the story that I wanted to explore with that. Congress of black women? <laughs> you know, historically, white men have, many white men have found black women attractive. But today I'm looking at all of the criticism of Michelle Obama, and I'm just wondering if those are just political statements or have things really changed? Um, you mean the comments about Yes, her? yes. I like think I'd say the Senator Sensenbrenner. I, I, I don't think that we can blatantly say that um, white men desired black no, women. Men. Yeah, but I mean, I can't really say that um, because when I look at photographs that I've seen, um, there there have been, the, the images that have circulated show opposite, um, has a different argument. So what I believe that, um, that their political statements, just the way images were used to destroy um, ourselves, our self-esteem and our self-representation, they're the words that are used today. It's the same experience that's happening. We see um, a way to denigrate um, you know, women, um, specifically a black woman in the White House. So there is a question, there's always, I'm in the classroom and, and I deal with it every day because Rarely do you see, you know, a black woman in the classroom, and for a, a young student who's uh, who's never had a black teacher before, um, and and they don't know how to deal with the fact that, oh, I have to listen to her. You know, she's you know she's not cleaning up my house, mm -hmm. and and I've had that experience um, with with students. So it's not new, it's just, it's just, it's politics and that's what they really believe. And um, I know that um, it's a difficult experience for people to imagine, to reimagine a black woman outside of their imaginary. And that's something that, that has to happen. And this is a reimagine the experience of what it is that they really think a black woman is. And that's something that I'm experiencing. Thank you, it was great to hear your presentation and great to hear the research evolve over the years. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question about if you found photographs of people constructing beauty by challenging constructions of femini femininity. So like women dressed in suits or women with other women, that kind of beauty mm -hmm. in the research that you're doing. Yes, um, Lorna Simpson has a number of the images. Uh, that's um, Micheline Thomas, uh, a lot of women are um, photographing and, and, and this whole sense notion of dandyism and, 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 and male fashion and, and that experience. That's um, a question I, I get a lot about uh, from young people who are looking for ways to, how do we see different ways of beauty in, in range um, in, in fashion and style? And that's a part of the research as well. But look at Lorna Simpson's work if you don't know her work. And, experience it. Yeah. I haven't seen you in a long, long time. <laughs> Once again, welcome back. Uh, my question was, um, what I have found interesting, uh, it may not deal, and you might have done in your presentation, I, I just came in, but uh, jazz icons. Um, as a young man, I had an opportunity to see a film called Nothing But a Man. Mm -hmm. 
with Abby Lincoln, and I was a very young man, and the beauty of this woman on screen literally got me interested in film. She was portrayed differently. If anyone has not seen this film, Nothing But a Man with Abby Lincoln. My question is, is that when I think of her, that led me to Nancy Wilson. That leads me to Shirley Bassey. Mm -hmm. It leads me to so many beautiful women that I believe that just through maybe the jazz scene mm -hmm. with women who are known and unknown, has, have you taken on maybe that? Is that in your presentation? I think you see where I'm going. Yeah, um, I love that movie as well. And someone just uh, shared with me that, just bought me, <laughs> just purchased and, and shared with me, I need to look at the interiors of that, of their, how they live. They had art in their homes, which I didn't recognize. They had Charles White in in their homes because Charles White was part of that community, of that Hollywood community. But yeah, Mary Lou Williams is in, in the book and Mary Lou Williams posed uh, you know, in front of her piano with her parakeet and so that's part of the story too, um, that, that experience of, of jazz and, and music. It's, it's such a, a broad history that um, you know, the publisher's like, enough already? You know, <laughs> you know, like, how can I look at all these images and how are you going to edit the images? So I, I, it was really hard to edit. Um, it was just a, a range. And, and I think a lot of it had to do with uh, just kind of a personal, you know, like you said, that, that movie, this is that personal, the personal moments. And then some were just historically just too profound not to include. And I started the project looking at at women, and then I realized there's so many men that I grew up with who were beautiful and knew it and <laughs> experienced it. So I decided midway through the project to include men and had to go back to identify the images that, that I found. So that's that range. Okay. Mm -hmm. When working on this project, which era did you find to be the most exciting or surprising? Um, the turn of the century, 1900 um, through 1929, maybe, um, because that you know we have um, we have the texts from that period, but we don't have the images. And to find that um, that there were public pageant, you know, pageants that that there was a um, the New York Age organized beauty contest in 1898. There were um, beauty contests that talk about well, what is a beautiful woman, you know, define, give me a definition of a beautiful black woman. So this discussion was going on not on the telephone, but in the public arena of the press. So I, I found that fascinating for me. And then the, the fact that women visited the photographic studio um, to become mail order brides, um, I mean, the fear that, I mean, just to, the, the fact that these women, they were fearless, you know, that they would leave Washington, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York, and move to Montana um, and pose and send the photograph. But one, one of the funny aspects about that is that the, the club was the Busy Bee Club, the women who, were, who read the letters before they shared the letters with the men in the community, the single men in the community, because they wanted to make sure that these women were not going to take their husbands, you know. <laughs> so they had that, you know, they controlled that, you know, they handpicked the women that they brought into the community. I found that just fascinating research, and there's more, uh, more stories about that, that that I, I would love to see, you know, some younger generation like Victoria out there <laughs> to do that kind of work. Okay, that's it. Okay, thank you. I have a you. question okay. about the, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're going to let you go. Yeah. <laughs> about the merry-go-round, mm -hmm. I've never seen that sort of icon before. I've seen mm -hmm. all kinds of mammies in different situations, but not at an amusement park where they are literally the ride. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could, first of all, did that photograph? Well, that was in a, a, a World's Fair in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, so that was in a public arena of the World's Fair. So it stayed on display for five months. But then it moved to the city, and so it, it actually was placed on the streets of Paris um, for that time period. Uh, for a, and Eugene Auger was the photographer who, who made that image. 
and it's in this book called Streets of Paris. Yeah, I, I, I and but what's also amazing about that that icon is that um, Paul Kalan, who is the designer for Josephine Baker, he created and designed that that um, merry-go-round. You know. <laughs> okay, let's give our speaker a loud round of applause. <laughs>